Jim, nice to see you again. Good to see after, you, Bertrand. After three years of this pandemic situation, I am very happy to, to visit you here in Botoshan again because you told me on the phone, Bogdan, as long as I am sitting, I am not moving a step away from, from my farm. That's for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. How are you doing? What's, doing what was happening in this period? Doing good, doing good. As you know, we've been continuing to grow and expand the business and we really are moving out of the next phase of moving into, from min tilling into no tilling. When we began, we've, we both started in 14, bought the first company. We stopped plowing as we bought each business. We bought six companies. We immediately stop ploughing and we sell the ploughs. And we then changed over to min tilling and now we are cover cropping and changing over to no till as much as possible. For me it's, a, it's not a, an, um, something that I cannot imagine about you because for our friends uh, it's better to, to say that uh, we know each other for almost 10 years now. Yes. And uh, when you first came in Romania we came with this dream to, to make agriculture in Romania and to change something in, uh, in the agriculture that we are, w was doing that time. And uh, I think it's important for our friend to know you better and to know your background. Where are you coming from? And for sure your experience in those technologies that you mentioned uh, min-till, no-till, conventional till, how you see the, the future agriculture uh, in Europe and to have a, a very friendly and open discussion like we all the times I'm, we are doing together uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our friends. Okay, um, I'm Irish, um, my family are a farming family, uh, my uncles were all farming. All farmers. My father worked for the Ford Motor Company. He wasn't lucky enough to go farming with it. And I trained to be a farm manager in Ireland. And in 1980, I farmed five hectares. I rented five hectares. And then I rented 20 and 40. And then by the early nine, by 1994, five, we were farming 1,200 hectares. Land is very expensive in Ireland. And so unless you inherit it, you rarely get to buy it. But in that time, I was lucky enough to do an off-field scholarship and I got to travel the world looking at agriculture and so I've been involved in setting up large-scale investment funds for farming. I had putting a business together in Australia in the late 90s, 12,000 hectare business in Western Australia where it was the first real experience of practical experience of no-till farming because all the crops were established there. Um, I was first introduced to no-till by Rex Jenkinson in the UK. But in 2005, a group was put a, a company called Agriterra, Agriterra Ireland together and we raised $56 million and we put together a business of 12,000 hectares of ownership in Argentina. And it's so different from Romania because one of our farms in, in Argentina was 10 kilometres long and 3.8 kilometres wide. No compacting, no stripes, nothing. Just and with all the farming and uh, all the cropping in Argentina by then was no-till. So we had no cultivation of any time on the farm. We were double cropping wheat and soybean in the one year, followed by corn, followed by full season soybean. That was the rotation. Here and there, one very poor land, we had some sunflower, but very little. And so that has been my experience uh, with no-till. But on my own farm in Ireland since 1992, we have been min tilling on my own farm in Ireland and we still min till to this day. I mean, I have in my farming business in Ireland where grass weeds are a big problem. We have a lot of land that hasn't been ploughed since 92, 93 time. It's very nice. It's very nice because, uh, you know, we are discussing those new technology uh, by a clima climatic change. But I imagine that in Argentina in 1981, mm -hmm. in Pampa Humeda, mm -hmm because I have a chance to visit for two weeks the, the area, uh, you, you do this uh, technology not because of lack of water like we are trying to manage uh, today in, in Romania. What was the purpose? What was the advantages that time that make you uh, uh, to think, to change the traditional and conventional um, 
let's say agriculture in Argentina to to mean till and then to no till? Uh, the Argentines, you know, are not subsidized. They have suffered from a bigger problem, is that they have retention taxes. So the government keep 30% of your soybean check and 25% of your corn check. You don't actually see the money. Yeah. It is retained by the buyer. And if you um, then think that you don't have a subsidy and you don't get a third of your check, your output, you've got to find a very cheap way to farm and farm well. And that's where no-till came in. And what they discovered is their yields took off and they were, they were blessed to meet this opportunity with GM crops as well. So all their crops are GM. And so GM soy and corn, just such a wonderful way of farming in an environmentally friendly way. Does it mean you, you have nothing against GM? You, you... I, I cannot understand Europe's stance on GM crops. I cannot, but Europe will learn that it, it, it's pretty difficult to, to produce food. And, and here in Romania, the technology we need is the, the, te, the, the water saving gene in corn. That we had in, in 2011, when we sold the business in Argentina, we, we had uh, the gene for water saving where the plant corn respired 27% less. It was just amazing what I was doing to yields. It was just amazing. And because you are coming from uh, from west part of Europe, mm -hmm. yeah, you you can look more ob objective to, to those things that we are facing now. And what do you think about the future? What will be the challenges in Europe regarding the, the food supply or the um, raw materials mm -hmm. for, for food in this new environment created by this war and those prices that are raising daily? Even before the war became an issue, we were facing into a food insecurity problem. Environmentalists have many different views about food security. I firmly believe that the environment, how you, your farm will be judged in the future is on the basis of its environmental credentials, as we call it, will be on the amount of energy, which is fuel and fertilizer and agrochemicals, how much of those you're using to produce a kilo of chicken meat, a kilo of beef, a liter of milk, a ton of grains. That will be the absolute test. How much energy are you using? And that's why I am so keen on converting our business to no-till farming, because we know that we can use a lot less of all inputs with no-till farming and cover cropping. With cover cropping, you start growing your own nitrogen. It's even amazing for me to discover that you are a fan of GM, but in same times, you are going with a very consistent part of your business in, uh, let's say, organic agriculture. Yes. Could you tell us how it's are fitting those different type of agriculture at the first view? It's very simple. As you know, the weather has become very extreme. You get years, 2015 was extraordinarily dry here in this part of Romania in Badasham, and 2020 was a disaster, as in most of Eastern Romania. We know. The organic farming business has so much money paid in subsidy, is it underwrites your business, it underwrites production. You know, so it has been, it is a form of security. It has been a form of security. But I don't think we can sustain here in Badashan on our sloping land organic agriculture because of the soil loss. You know, we have to hoe and hoe to kill the weeds. Then we get an enormous thunderstorm and the soil being washed all over the place. And so we're losing our most valuable resource because with no till farming, we're actually rebuilding topsoil, not dissipating it. Uh, for me, it's a, until now, it's a unique opportunity to prove that uh, the coexistence of those three agriculture, GM, conventional and organic, mm -hmm. is possible to stay together in one farm. And you are, for me today, the best example to coexist. Exactly. Yes, and the people to uh, uh, think out of the box, let's mm -hmm. say, and to try to do their best. 
for me at the beginning when we met each other and you was telling me about how to, to make the sustainable agriculture, yeah. how to improve the organic matter and so on, uh, was a, a kind of, you know, in my area, uh, uh, organic matter in the Cernosium was, let's say, 5%, no issue with the pH and so on. For sure, you experiment a lot of, let's say, technology in a lot of environment. What was the reason for you to choose Botosha? Very simple. Price of the land and the quality. The quality of the land we got for the price we paid was spectacular. Very simple. And, and Balashan historically has very good rainfall figures. The 70 year average up to 2014 was that we got 60 millimeters in May, 85 in June, 85 in July, and 60 in August. Now we've had six very dry years with very poor Julys and August. Last year it reverted to near normal rainfall, not quite, but near normal rainfall. And we had wonderful yields because it was near normal rainfall. So, you know, we are very happy as long as we get near normal rainfall and we must take our farming to adjust to the f circumstances we find ourselves. Our circumstances will be, will be drier and hotter. And so we must adjust our agriculture to do, to do that. And to do that, we must go to no-till using cover crops and keeping our land covered, having as much residue on the surface to keep the land cool in the summer and to keep all the water that falls and stop the evaporation of water from our land in hot times and in the winter and in the spring with dry times. You see in the, the, today we're in the fields, where the cover is, there's beautiful moisture underneath for seeding into. We're seeding into, we've, we've had 100 millimeters of rain in seven months and we're seeding into lovely moisture. That was very amazing for me because uh, if I am not looking that the area is very hilly area, yeah, which is creating a big issue for you mm. to manage, like keeping the water mm. uh, when are coming, like you mentioned, maybe uh, one day 50 millimeters. You have to keep on the soil and you have to find the solution to, to keep it. Uh, the soil is looking like in the south. Yeah, it's, it's changing, even the color being, being full of water and covered. Mm. It's looking more friendly when we touch, you know, mm. it's, it's, it's very, very nice feeling. Yes, it, part of that comes from, we, we've been the cover, not plowing and leaving all the residue on, st on top and the organic matter is rising and building. Plus the fact, a lot of our land has close to 40% clay in it, which leaves it very difficult to work with high magnesium levels as well. So we've been applying huge amounts of calcium carbonate. Over the last seven years, we've applied 32,000 tonnes of calcium carbonate across all our land. And that has a huge influence on the quality of the land. We brought all our pHs to 6.3, 6.4, 6.5. But the calcium carbonate, the calcium in the soil has opened up the soil, made it much better at soaking in the water, made it much more workable and much more crop friendly. How you choose to, to let's say, to, to do this with the soil, you know, check. I know from you that you are not doing all the, uh, you are doing all the analysis of the soil. Yes. Uh, in US. Yeah, yes. You send the sample today and in one week it you result. have... You have the results very detailed yes. with all the minerals, with all the yeah. micro elements and so on. Tell us a little bit about uh, how, to, how you manage this, because for sure it's not to spend less, it's to uh, redirect the money yes. from the savings that you made through uh, no-till to um, uh, change the pH, to add the uh, micro elements and how you see this, this uh, uh, let's say, mineral part and pH on the soil? Plant feeds itself through its roots. We have dozens of guys coming to sell us this foliar and that foliar to uh, put on the leaves. Yeah, it's, it's like it gives us a nice green feel for a week, but yield response is not significant. In a lot of Romania, the land is very low in zinc. 
Well, we've been applying zinc sulfate to the land because in a dry time, the plant feeds itself through the root. The corn will be sucking up water to assemble the nutrients it needs. And if there's very low levels of zinc, it will soak, take up a lot more water to, to get access to zinc it needs. So we're trying to level our soil, raise our soil levels of zinc and boron so as we use that less, we're, when we're seeding our corn and our soybeans and our sugar beet, all our crops, we're seeding 50 millimeters below the seed and 50 millimeters out a band of other things we need. From our trace elements, or from our tests, we will make up then a mix of what we need. So for instance, the corn, it will get 50 kilos of active substance nitrogen, 50 kilos of phosphorus, 10 kilos of sulfur and three and a half kilos of zinc with the cedar. Then we will come back when the corn is six, seven days with UAN, with drop pipes in our sprayer and drop it in right on the corn, alongside the corn plants. But we'll use an awful lot less nitrogen. Because we have building up our organic matter levels, we will get over the course of the season, 22, 24 kilos of nitrogen for each 1% organic matter. Our average organic matter now is, is 4.9%. So over the course of the season, we're getting 110, 20 kilos of free nitrogen. So we will actually, this year, in the corn crops, we're hoping to yield more than 10 tonnes, we will only apply a total of 100 kilos of nitrogen. Now we will place it very close to the plant, and, 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 and you know, so as we get the best bang for our buck, you know. Up to now, we've been applying a lot of phosphorus and mixing it in to the soil to raise the soil level. And now we've invested in that and we've bought a lot of land and we're investing in our land. We're investing in our land for long, the long term, that we will really have productive land long term.